Oh, Lord Jesus, you know the number of our sins. You know the extent of our sins. You know the nature of our sins much, much better than we do. You have a complete grasp of that which you suffered for much better than we do. Oh, Jesus, as we seek to remember you this morning, we pray for grace that we would be able to do that well. And we pray it in your name. Amen. Well, this is the point in our service where we take some time to remember Jesus. In a few moments, we're going to be taking a small wafer and a bit of juice. These are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ that was offered up in place of believers at the cross. To help us remember Jesus today, we're going to be looking at a passage that gives us a good look at the person of Jesus, but not only the person of Jesus, uh, the position of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus here in his earthly ministry. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Galatians chapter 4? We're going to be looking at verses 4 and 5 together. Uh, we have some men coming forward. If you don't have a Bible, simply raise your hand. They will get a copy of God's word to you. If you don't have a Bible for yourself, if you don't possess one, please consider this to be our gift to you so that you can read God's word for yourself. The setting here at the end of chapter 3 in Galatians is that Paul is making the point that the Old Testament law was never intended to impart spiritual life. It was never intended to give a righteousness. Observation of the law was not the means by which a person becomes righteous. Instead, Paul makes the point that the law was intended to point us away from ourselves and anything that we could do, point us to the person of Christ and the righteousness that's found in him when we have trust in his work in our place at the cross. So as we begin to look at chapter 4, Paul is talking about the person of Jesus and why it is that he has that righteousness, the righteousness that a person can possess only when they have that faith in Christ. So as we read our passage today, again, be looking what this passage says about the person of Christ and about the position of Christ and about the purpose of Christ. Starting in chapter 4, verse 4. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, born under the law. So that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Looking at the person of Christ, we see two descriptions of Christ in verse 4. The first is that Jesus was God's son. He was identical in nature to the Father. There was no difference in the deity of Jesus and the deity of the Father. And Jesus had to be identical in nature to God because only the sacrifice of a perfectly holy life could atone for the infinite offense that our sin is against a holy God. So Jesus was fully God. And he had to be God. But that same verse also tells us more about Jesus. It tells us that he was born of a woman. This means that Jesus was also fully man in every way that we are, except that he was without sin. God's design for salvation is that his anger against the sinner is appeased only when that anger is poured out against a spotless representative of that sinner. And because Jesus was born of a woman, he was able to be, he was qualified to be man's representative before God in God's system of justice. So that's the person of Jesus. He's fully God. That's necessary. He's fully man. That's equally necessary. Verse 4 also tells us about the position of Jesus. This is so important for us to grasp. It tells us that Jesus was born under the law which means that Jesus' life was measured by the same measure of righteousness, the same standard that God measures all of us. Every aspect of Jesus' life from the moment he took his first breath until he gave up his spirit when he was on the cross was measured against God's perfect standard of righteousness. And Jesus met that standard of righteousness exceedingly. But it's good for us to think about what that minutes means for a minute. That means that when Jesus was an infant, and when he was a toddler, and when he was a child, when he was an adolescent, and when he was a young man, everything about him was completely free of even the smallest hint, the smallest suggestion of sin. Jesus never disobeyed his parents as a two-year-old. He never spoke an unkind, sinful word against any of his siblings when he was seven years old. 
never did. He never looked with sinful lust or desire on an attractive young woman in Nazareth as a young man. He never did. He never became inwardly impatient, not even once, with anybody. Never in all of his life. The author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 4 that Jesus has been tempted in all things as we are, and yet he was without sin. He satisfied every single condition of God's perfect law in place of those for whom he would die. It's really important for us to get the, the position of Jesus. We benefit from that position. And we move to verse 5 and we see the purpose of Jesus. And this is where we rejoice. Jesus did all of this so that he could redeem those who were under the law. And to redeem means to purchase away from the power of another by the payment of a price. Every one of us was under God's law. We feel the weight of God's law testifying against us at every turn. It's a standard we can't possibly meet. But Jesus, who was qualified because he was fully God and he was fully man, and he had satisfied every condition and every term of God's law, he rescued those who would put their trust in him based on the work that he would do in their place at the cross. And he did this at the cost of giving his own life. That's what we want to remember about Jesus this morning. The rest of verse 5 helps us see the result and the benefit of Jesus' work. That we might receive the adoption as sons. And this is so good, and we know this. Adoption is the process by which a child benevolently becomes a part of a family to which they don't naturally belong. In our natural-born condition, we don't belong in a relationship with God. Our sin disqualifies us from that. But a person is made to be in that family relationship by the righteousness of Jesus that is imputed into them when they place their trust in him. And that's the good news that a believer celebrates today. The Christian comes to the Lord's table to remember Jesus, and let's remember Jesus that way. His purpose was to redeem us, to make us part of God's family, to make us part of God's kingdom. He did that as one who was fully qualified to do it because he satisfied the terms of God's holy law. So, believer, when the elements come to you today, take them and hold them and consider your life this week. Consider all the things for which Jesus died and then rejoice that his work was sufficient to satisfy God's righteous demands of you and that you stand before him justified because of your belief in Christ and what he's done for you. And then when your heart is prepared and ready, take the elements on your own. Those of you who are here this morning, I just want to talk to you and encourage you to consider carefully what it means to be redeemed. In our lives as people, we can redeem ourselves from lots of things. If we do badly on a test, we can redeem ourselves the next time by studying a little more. If we do badly in a game, we can play harder or practice harder the next time. But there is absolutely no way you can redeem yourself before the Lord because we don't possess the resources ourselves. We don't have the wherewithal within ourselves to do it. The only one who does is the person of Jesus Christ. He possesses the righteousness we need to be right in God's standing, to be right before God. So as the others are taking communion, take this time to consider your position before God. After the service, there will be some people over here in the corner, and they will be happy to talk with you about a relationship with Christ. So men, come and serve us, and I'll come back and close our time in prayer.